Hebrews 4.11 Therefore let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. <clears throat> 411. It follows logically from this that the readers should, along with the author, note, let us make every effort to enter that rest. So the author counts himself as better be uh, do, 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 do diligence, do diligence. <laughs> Unlike the assurance which all Christians have that they possess eternal life and will be raised up to enjoy it in the presence of Christ. John 6, 39 to 40. The shape, the share of the companions of Messiah in his dominion over creation is attained by doing his will to the end. Revelation 2, 27. 26 to 27. The reader must therefore be warned by Israel's failure in the desert to take care that they not follow hang on that they not follow Israel's example of disobedience. We have Expositor's Bible commentary on these verses 316 to 411. For who provoked him when they heard, had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? The author presses home this point, his point, by three questions that emphasize that it was the people who were in a position of spiritual privilege and yet sinned grievously who were in mind in Psalm 95. Some scholars, it is true, take times, Times, T-I-N-E-S, rendered some or who. As the indefinite pronoun and not as an interrogative, 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 as does King James Version, for some did provoke, but some it is a strange designation for practically the whole nation. In any case, it is better to see the same construction in all three of these verses. The first question then asks, who were they who heard and rebelled? The verb rebelled is found only here in the New Testament. Though a cognate noun occurs in verse 8, it means embitter, make angry, and is a strong expression for the rebellious attitude that characterized the Exodus generation. Now the writer answers his question with another. This one phrased so as to expect the answer, yes, all those Moses led out of Egypt is comprehensive, but that Joshua and Caleb are not mentioned does not invalidate the argument. It's only two. The nation was characterized by unbelief, and the faithfulness of two men does not alter this. NIV says that Moses led the people out of Egypt, but more literally, the author said that they came out through Moses, implying that they acted of their own volition and made a good start. Verse 17, and with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? I think of this myself, wow. What would I have done in those days? The second question refers to those God was angry with those 40 years. For the anger of God, see comments on verses 10 and 11. In the earlier treatment of the incident, Verses 7 to 8, the 40 years referred to testing God and seeing his works. Here it refers to the continuing wrath of God, as in the Hebrew and the, and the Septuagint. The wrath of God was not something transitory and easily avoided. It lasted throughout the wilderness period. Note from my understanding that the Israelites in the wilderness were willing to repent and were forgiven. But God's wrath continued justifiably because they had not earned resting, gaining his rest. The question, was it not, employs the emphatic uchi, found in only one other place in this epistle, in Hebrews 1.14. Its use leaves no doubt whether, whatever that God was angry with, the sinners in question, their punishment is mentioned in words taken from 
a reminiscent of Numbers 14, 29 to 32. The author may be quoting, or he may simply be using scriptural language to add solemnity to this point. He reminds his readers that in the past those who sinned against God had been destroyed and, indeed, as the verbs in the Numbers passage are future, since they were spoken before the event, that they were destroyed as it was prophesied. The word rendered desert refers to deserted land. It is wilderness country in contrast to cultivated and inhabited land. It can be used for pasture. Here it is the uninhabited area the Israelites passed through on their wanderings. In Hebrews 3.18 And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? The question, third question refers to those to whom the oath was sworn. Those who would not enter God's rest were those who disobeyed. The word apatheo means properly disobey. But some accept the meaning disbelieve. This is possible since for the early Christians, the supreme disobedience was a refusal to believe their gospel or the good news, depending upon, in this case, Hebrews, sometimes the gospel, the good news, means a good news, not necessarily involving salvation unto eternal life. Just depends upon context. But here it seems that we should talk, take the meaning disobey. God did much for these people, but yet in the end, they went their own way and refused to obey him. But I maintain that it comes out of unbelief because the very next verse says so. So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Now in verse 19, which reads, So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. The depressing conclusion sums up what has gone before. The author does not say that they did not enter but that they were not able to enter. Sin is self-defeating, and unbelief of itself prevents us from entering God's rest. This is not an arbitrary penalty imposed by a despotic God. It is the inevitable outcome of unbelief. In the Greek, the final word in this section of the argument, thrown to the end of the sentence for greater emphasis, is apistia, apistia, unbelief. That is what robbed the wilderness generation of the rest that they had reason to expect when they came out of Egypt. It seems like eternal life is not in view here, but the rest of God, the reward of God, the co-rulership of God, and the warning is because of what we saw in that wilderness generation, what about the first century generation that the Hebrew author wrote to, what about we believers in the church age? The warning to the people of the writer's day is clear. To slip back from their Christian profession into unbelief would be fatal. Yeah, not for eternal life, but for entering God's rest, called rulership. What's eternity going to look like? when your, your rewards are scarce because of unbelief. And acting upon that unbelief is unfaithfulness. There's a, some notes on 12. Four one. We're moving on into verse... 1 of chapter 4. Therefore let us fear if while the promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. Christians enter the, the rest. Verses 1 through 10 of chapter 4. The author argues that the purposes of God are not frustrated because Israel of old disobeyed him and failed to enter the rest he had promised his people. The promise remains, if the ancient Israelites did not enter God's rest, then someone else will, namely the Christians. Of course, 
two dispensations are involved here, and the issues that are the same, though. As you go through the Christian life, or you go through the life of believers uh, in ancient Israel or the first century, they're believers, they're Hebrew, Hebrew believers. Uh, how will you respond as perseverance is required and, uh, and uh, you not falling into unbelief and uh, moving away from the gospel and back into legalism, which is what the author of Hebrews is talking about. But it can be applied to any believer of any age. Bible study manuals know a future generation of Israel will enter God's rest in fulfillment of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, according to God's decree, sovereignty and promise. Otherwise, God and his word, the Bible is seriously flawed. His promises are not trustworthy. Let me just pop on over to Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Just as a little side here. The whole days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of who? The church? No. House of Israel or the house of Judah. Not like the covenant, the Old Testament covenant. Well, the old covenant is the Mosaic law. Which I made with their fathers in the day. I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke. Although I was husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel, house of Judah, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them. Oh, and on their heart I will write it. God will do that unilaterally. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. There you go. Once more, God's chosen people. Heretofore, since first century and before, they were no longer God's chosen people. Those generations. But there will be a new generation. They will not teach it again. Each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, for the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So they, won't have, they will know the word of God. They'll be without sin. They'll live thousands, a thousand years. Amazing. That second coming, that generation. But this should not lead to complacency if the Israelites of an earlier day, with all their advantages, fail to enter the rest. Christians ought not to think there will be automatic acceptance for them. They must take care lest they too fail to enter the blessing. I guess as we grow older in the faith and have more responsibility and knowledge, we're held to a greater standard. And we can't be a, a bad example to others. That's the thing I struggle with all these years studying the Bible. I've read a couple of studies as of late as well. That's, that's good stuff. I'd forgotten I'd done that. This is one of the studies. Christians have another destiny, one of their own as part of the body of Christ. Not as priests of the nations of the world, but of co-rulership with Jesus Christ over the universe. How much co-rulership? It was 4.1, Therefore let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. NIVs, let us be careful as more strictly let us fear. And the exhortation comes first in the sentence. It is emphatic because the writer does not want his readers to be complacent. There is real danger of God's promises. There is real danger. God's promises mean much to the writer. And indeed, the word "epangelia" promise occurs more often in Hebrews than in any other New Testament book. Fourteen times. Galatians is ten. The promise is question in question still stands. That is to say, though it has not been fulfilled, it has not been revoked. We have a promise, each one of us, individually, as God has decreed us, and as we should willfully, in our own will, follow, in our own volition. In one sense, of course, there is, was a fulfillment. For the generation 
after the men who died in the wilderness entered Canaan. 